morning again, Redeemers. Good to be with you. If you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to open them up to Psalm 131. In case you're visiting with us, we've been making our way through Psalm 120 through Psalm 134. These are known as the Psalms of Ascent, and uh, we've been working through them this summer. And we're going to be in Psalm 131 this morning. A song of ascent of David. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Let's pray. Father, uh, we do come and do ask your blessing upon your word. As we have uh, looked at uh, several weeks ago, uh, lest the Lord watches, the watchmen watch in vain. Unless the Lord enables our hearing and my preaching, then we are here in vain. And so, Father, I pray that you will give power from on high, that you will empower both the deliverer of your word, but also those who receive your word. That the cares of this world and the anxieties of our hearts can choke the word out, and impure motives of the preacher can also harm his own soul as well. And so, Father, we approach your word as equally needy. Would you, by your spirit, lift our eyes to see the wonderful things in your law? Would you forgive us all of our sins? And would you uh, anoint all that is happening in this hour? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I've entitled our sermon, uh, uh, The Journey Within the Journey being one from pride to one to trust and faith. If you've been with us, then we've talked about the psalm of ascents as being psalms that pilgrims would pray or sojourners would sing as they made that pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And so they were on a physical pilgrimage. Wherever they lived throughout all of Israel, three times a year, God's people had to come to Jerusalem And so they would physically change locations. They would leave their homes, pack things up, and travel to a different physical location, a location appointed by God himself. But there's a journey within that journey, right? They're making a physical movement, a physical change, but the psalmist has put this psalm here, and and it's like a playlist. You guys, have have you ever made a playlist, like when you're working out or When you're traveling, you put a playlist together and everybody traveling with you has to listen to that playlist at the same time. Think about the Psalms of Ascent like that. Like like an arranger has put these specific Psalms together here and as all of Israel, as a corporate community, as they were traveling, they were all singing and praying the same thing at the same time. Now there's a journey within the journey. They're not just on a journey physically from one place to another. The arranger is taking them on a journey of their souls. Did you notice how often soul comes up? Look at it right there in verse 2. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a winged child is my soul within me. In other words... The question that we need to ask of this passage is, what journey of the soul does the arranger want to take God's people on? He wants to take them from pride, where they think they know it all, where they think they've merited God's favor, where everyone is right, everyone is wrong, and they're always the ones right. 
where they're trusting in their own righteousness and God's grandness and beauty has been diminished. He wants to take them from that place where their souls are clamorous and noisy and loud and boastful and prideful. He wants to move them to a place where their soul is trusting and quiet and steady independent. That's the journey within the journey, moving them from pride and moving them to quiet hope and trust in the Lord. I don't know about you, but I need that. I think we all need that. But it's very easy to be prideful and to not be able to detect it. Pride is kind of one of those sins. It's not like some of the the, 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 the sins that are big and grand, that, that are obvious and noticeable. You know, pride kind of hides in the darkness. You can be prideful and no one can discern it or detect it. And the Holy Spirit, through his word, shines the light on all of us and calls us out of it. Now, I want to look at this under three headings. The danger, discerning it in our own lives and how we're delivered. The danger, the pull towards pride is real. If you have an NIV Bible, um, the NIV just flat out says it, right? The opening line is, my heart is not proud, Lord. Now, if you have an ESV, what it tries to do is to preserve the Hebrew idiom of my heart not being lifted up. But make no mistake about it that, that this psalm is about pride, a heart that is lifted up, eyes that are raised too high, being occupied with things too great and too marvelous are all talking about different aspects of pride. Now, at first glance, it reads as if we ought to give David a pass, right? Look at it. I mean, he actually uses not three different times. Oh, Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. So on the surface, it reads like, man, like, Dave, what are we talking about pride for? Because this man is saying he's not prideful. But did you notice verse 2? I have calmed and quieted my heart, my soul. Did you catch that? If he has calmed and quieted his soul, then the implication or the inference that we have to make is before he penned this psalm, his soul was not quiet and it was not calm. And so you're getting a before and after. We don't have the before, but what we do know is before he penned this psalm, his eyes were high. He was occupying himself with things too great for him. That he did have haughty eyes and a lifted heart. And this shouldn't surprise us, right? We know David's life. He is called a man after God's heart. But then when you read the Bible, don't we see evidences? But that's just not true in the moment. What about 2 Samuel 11? When the king should have been at war. And because his home is taller than Uriah's home, and Uriah is actually on the battlefield, he sees Uriah's wife bathing. And he inquires who she is. And it doesn't just say she's the wife of Uriah. They also tell David who her father is. And so David is hearing that, hey, she belongs to, she's the daughter of so-and-so. Hey, she's the wife of so-and-so. And David still, in his pride, he summons her. It's pride. What about later in David's life? In in 1 Chronicles 21, when it says Satan incited David's, David's heart to take a census. 
And David commands his leaders to go and count Israel and count Judah. And Joab, his military commander, says, David, you don't need to do this. David, only God knows how many people are in Israel, and may God know that number, and may he add to it exceedingly and abundantly more. Are you sure you want to count the people? And he does. And that was pride. Because you know what happened after that? David's heart was pricked. And the Lord came to him, and he says, how do you want it? You want me to judge you? You want your enemies to pursue you? Or do you want a famine to come upon Israel? But make no mistake about it, what you have done is prideful and wrong. And on that day, 70,000 Israelite men died. Think about that image. David gets to be king. He gets to raise his family. And you know what happens to 70,000 men? They lose their lives. Wives become widows. Children become orphans. Those who had means become poor. What about David's child with Bathsheba? That child doesn't live. What about Uriah? He dies. That's pride. That's the danger of it. That it harms and it hurts and it kills and it destroys and we would be mistaken to think that our pride doesn't bring about the same type of destruction is this how churches are hurt is this our families are destroyed this is how marriages become unhinged it's our pride pride. Now, the question that I want to put before us is, how do we discern it, right? It's dangerous and it's real, but how do we discern it? I want to shift gears and and consider maybe why it's important for Psalm 131 to be here. Why would the arranger put this here and make this be a psalm that all of Israel would sing and and pray collectively as they journey. Like, like why would an, a master arranger put that here? I think there's a clue, and you might remember, in the very first Psalm of Ascent, Psalm 120, it's a throwaway verse, but I think it's really important. In the throwaway verse, the psalmist actually says, I have been sojourning in Meshech, living among the tents of Kedar for too long, have I had my dwelling place among those who hate peace and love war? That's how the Psalm of Ascent began with this Israelite man in a foreign land around people who hate God and who love war, and he is excited to get on a journey. Can't you start to see the image of if you are living in a pagan land or you're working with non-believers, all of a sudden they see you shut your business down, board your house up, pack up your belongings, and you get on your animals, and you start this long pilgrimage to Jerusalem, can you imagine how you might feel? I'm God's chosen one. I get to go to the city of Jerusalem, and you're stuck here. My God is the God of the universe, and you don't know him, and you are condemned in your sins, 
everything you've done to me. Don't worry about it. One day he's going to repair. Can, can, can you feel how one might easily be prideful as they are making their way on the journey, passing by people who aren't on the journey, passing by people kind of tormenting them and persecuting them? Can you start to feel why they might start to smell themselves? And what the arranger does is says, wait a minute, there ain't nobody high and mighty but God. It is not y'all. And you are only on this journey because of his grace. And apart from his grace, you will be just like them still staying in your rebellion and sin. You have no reason to be prideful on this journey. It's the reason why in Deuteronomy chapter 7, and mind y'all, this is before, before they get the land, before they get a king, before they do anything, you want to know what, what, what Moses writes in Deuteronomy? When in the future the Lord your God brings you into the land to take possession of it and clears away many nations before you, nations more numerous, nations more mightier, remember that you are a chosen people for his possession out of all the peoples on the face of the earth, and it was not because you were more in number. It was not because you were special. It was because he was being faithful to his own name. God tells them that before they go into the land because he knows when you give grace to sinful people, it has a tendency to make us prideful. We have a tendency to take something that is free and good and beautiful and to turn it on its head and to somehow think that we built this platform ourselves. And so what this psalm is doing is toning it down a notch. So what are some of the important aspects of pride in this passage? I think David seems to be unpacking it for us and it's multi-layered, and it's progressive. Now, there are three parts to it in this passage that I think are relevant. One, it's, it's inward. Pride starts to shape how we view ourselves. That in the Hebrew, it literally reads, O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My heart is not tall. And so pride is being tall-hearted. Now, why does that matter? You might remember Saul, when Saul became king of Israel. Do you remember how he's described? He's described as being taller and more handsome than all of the other Israelites. And that is not just a physical marker. The writer is preparing you for his tallness of heart. And when you start to see his actions, his conduct, his lack of reverence, like when you start to see his kingship, what you're getting typified right in front of you as you read that, that's pride. It's tall heartedness. The tall hearted person is above, uh, he's above correction. The tall hearted person is above rebuke. The tall hearted person is above any notion that you might not be the smartest person everywhere. The tall-hearted person comes across as having all the answers, having it all together. The tall-hearted person wants to always focus on someone else's sins and not their own. The tall-hearted persons want to deflect rather than own and take ownership and repent. What they want to do is point outward all the time and never deal with them and themselves. And so it starts to shape how we view ourselves. And once we are tall-hearted, then everyone else is small. You're not as smart as me. You don't have it together as me. 
your opinions and your views, they're secondary. And that's why David opens this next frame up. He says, my eyes are not raised too high, but what does it mean to be high-eyed? It's to belittle a haughty spirit. For Saul, it wasn't enough that he was handsome. The way it's written is he was more handsome than all of the other Jewish men. You, you, you see that subtle thing? It's not enough to have a thing, but you have to have more than everyone else. You have to be exalted. And for you to be exalted, everyone else has to be diminished, right? The, the haughtiness goes hand in hand with pride. One counselor was asked the question, you know, plumbers are often asked, what's the worst thing you've seen? Or doctors are often asked, like, what's the toughest thing that you've treated? Or lawyers are often asked, what's your most difficult case? And, and he talked about, as a counselor, what he's asked the most is, what do you see most often? When you counsel couples, or you do counseling in families, or when you meet with people in recovery, like, like, like talk to me about what is it that you see the most. And here's what he writes. When couples come to me for the first time, they often have a list of offenses committed against them by their spouse as well as a rehearsed inventory of behaviors they expect their partner to change. And similarly, parents often bring children to counseling, reporting that they need to learn new ways of being respectful and self-controlled and helpful around the house. And these offenses need to be heard and heard tenderly. But furthermore, their behaviors they want to see change often do need reformation. And at the same time, during the course of our work together, when I change the perspective and ask leading questions like, well, what have you done to your spouse or your kid or your world? Or what might you need to repent of? Or how can you display Christ to them in the same way that you long for them to display Christ to you? I don't usually get answers. I get hurt and confused stares, and often I get downright indignation. He says, pride is the most numerous thing that I battle against in a counseling room. Pride. And it makes sense, right? It's inward. We are high. It's outward. Others are low. And then it's upward. Did you notice what David says? I do not occupy or walk about myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. Marvelous there can be translated hidden or unknown. And so David isn't simply saying things are too grand. He's also talking about the hidden thing, the things that are beyond our ability to understand and comprehend. And in pride, in our humanity, we will want to soar where God soars. That it's not enough to be finite. It's not enough to have limits with our knowledge. It's not enough to accept the lot given to us. We want to be like God. Knowing what God knows. Understanding what only God can understand. And this is more subtle than you think. Take suffering, for example. Take Job, for example, a man who lost everything, all of his children. 
That's hard. That would like do me in. And you remember when Job and his friends are trying to discern the why of suffering? You remember they they started to kind of come up with all of these reasons he's suffering? And by Job 38, 39, 40, and 41, God has like had enough. He's like, meet me outside at the break of dawn, and you can get it how you get it. And what does God say to Job? He says, dress for action like a man, and I will question you, and you make it known to me. He says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? You tell me, you understand, right? You want to fly high in my mind? You tell me where you were. Do you know where the gates of death are? Did did you set the boundaries of the sea and the ocean? Did you put mane on the horse? He says, answer me. Come on, you want to talk and you want to reason. You answer me right here and right now. You know what Job says after God comes to him? He says, I'm of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once, and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. You you get that image? That occupying ourselves, stepping over this boundary, Job tried to go there and answer the why, and he says, wait a minute, there's a boundary between me and the Lord. There are some things too grand, too mighty too big, too heavy, too complex for me and my finiteness to grasp. Let us not think that David was the only one to deal with this. On our way home, the pull towards pride is real. You and I have been lavish with his grace. And we start to think we did something to earn it. We start to look at others as small. We don't see the image of God in all of humanity. And has your mind ever tried to cross into the great and hidden things of God? And I don't want the Sunday school answer. Has your mind ever gone there? Why? God, you say that you're holy, that you are not the author of sin. Well, why? Why is Satan here? And why does he wreak havoc on this world? Why? Does it feel like this country has been built on the backs of black people. Why? My mind goes there. Why? And I talk to someone in my neighborhood about the image of God in everyone. Three weeks later, the same guys that I care about break it into my car. Why? Why this virus? People are dying. Scared. And lonely. Why? And why can I have children? and kids are killed, why? Why? You say that you hold the hearts of kings and rulers in your hand and that you superintend everything that we do? Then why, when November comes, no matter which side you're on, 
somebody's going to be hurt and crushed. Why? Do you struggle with this same thing your whole life? You don't get deliverance right here and right now. Why? Do you want to be married, but you don't desire the opposite sex? You see what this does to our souls? That when we start to go in those places, it unsettles and it rocks and it roars and it makes us noisy and it can make us angry. It can make us bitter. It can make us afraid. It can make us hopeless. Do not make the mistake and think that we don't suffer from this type of pride. It's real. And if you're honest, you've thought it. And here's the good news. Deliverance is possible. It goes without saying that for those of us who are in Christ, the sin of pride has been atoned for on the cross. The one who is truly upright in heart, with a name that is above every name, he took on flesh and he became obedient, even to the point of death, death on a cross. God's ultimate deliverance for our high-mindedness and high-heartedness was sending his only son who was meek and lowly at heart, who stood at attention and said, Father, I trust you, who stood at attention and says, Father, I will submit myself to your will and your ways that for us, our deliverance comes through the finished work of Jesus. Pride dies in the shadow of the cross unworthy, unable, unwilling. We all needed to be rescued from ourselves and delivered into the family of God by the power, the righteousness, and the grace of another. And that person is Jesus. And if you are in him, that same power is what empowers our smaller deliverances here and now from pride. Did you notice what David says in verse 2? This is hope, y'all. But I have calmed and quieted my soul. This isn't passive. Like, this is active. Like, yes, David was prideful, but at this point in time, he actually says, I have gone to war with myself, not somebody else, with me. I have went to war with my own soul. And that soul that was tumultuous and noisy and clamorous and high-minded and high, heavy-hearted, that soul that looked down on people, that soul that wanted to be like God, knowing what only God can know, he says, I have quieted it. And so do not make the mistake to think that killing our pride is passive. Like we're supposed to just sit back and let it happen. That's not what David says. I've gone to war with me. With me. Now what allows this? This means that we need to be in the habit of cultivating humility. What compels us? What enables us to kill our pride? What does he compare his soul to in this psalm? He doesn't just give us a word. He gives us an image. Now, images matter in the psalm of a sense. 
as they travel, they see things. And as they see things, they're able to say, oh, 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 that right there that I see, it helps me understand more about God and who he is. And so if these are some of the images that we've already talked about in the Psalm of Ascent. But as the watchmen stand watch, so does the Lord stand watch over me. Psalm 125, as they come near Jerusalem and they see Jerusalem surrounded by mountains, they say, so is the Lord surrounding his people. Psalm 28, they, 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 128, they pass by olive trees and the image sticks. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine and your children like olive shoots, Right? Or what about the watchmen who are watching for the sun to come up? And it says, as the watchmen watch for the sun, so my soul waits for the deliverance of God. It's all through these psalms where these images that they're seeing around them are being used as spiritual metaphors. And it's the same thing in this passage. David looks. And he sees a nursing child. And he sees that nursing child resting on his mother's chest. And he says, that's an image. That's it right there. Now, there's a subtle distinction in, in, in 2B and 2C to be, right, where it says, I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. But look at the verse under it, like a weaned child is my soul within me. It could be translated like the weaned child upon me, my soul. You hear what's happening? He sees a contented child who has been fed, and who is resting on mother's chest. Or perhaps he looks down at his own child, and he's holding him or her tight, and they're asleep. And they're not worried about anything but resting in the chest of David says, that's what my soul is like. It was prideful, it was haughty, it was tumultuous, but now it's, it's, it's like this. The question then is, who is it that's inviting David? Leave your pride. You come lay on my chest. Who is fathering the king? Who is caring for the king? It's God. God is being portrayed as a tender mother and a nurturing father. Do you know how comforting that is to know that through Jesus you have been engrafted into God's family and you are his son and you are his daughter? You know the passages in Isaiah? Can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. This tenderness, Isaiah 42, for a long time I've held my peace. I have kept still and restrained myself, says the Lord. But now I will cry out like a woman in labor. I will gasp and pant. That's the pain and the agony that God feels for his people. What about Hosea 13, 8? God says, I will fall upon them like a bear robbed of her cubs, and I will tear them apart. That is God talking about how he feels about you. I will tear them apart. In my judgment, if they mess with my kids, What about Psalm 
103, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. What about 1 John 3, 1? See what kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. Matthew 7, or which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does your Father in heaven? You can go down the path of the mothering of God, For God likens his love for his people to a mother. You can go down the path of the fathering of God. But the overarching theme is that we're children of God. And that's how our pride is melted. You see, it's not a fight to put pride to death. It's a fight to bring our gospel identity to life. It's not a fight to stop merely being prideful. It's a fight to start resting in him again. We lean into our gospel identity and embrace the good news. What melts our pride? It's by remembering that Jesus didn't come for the tall of heart, but he came for the bruised and broken The way up is the way down. He didn't come for those who are righteous. He came for those who are sick. You don't have to win the approval of other people. You have the approval of the king of heaven. You don't have to make yourself look good in the sights of other. Jesus thought you were worthy enough to put his love upon. Do you see how that starts to melt our pride? And you don't have to understand all of the whys and all of the unknowns. If God, who can do the mysterious, the mysteries of God, are sealed up in Jesus, if God himself would come and bear God's wrath to make God haters, sons and daughters, if God would do this profound mystery to rescue people and we benefit from that mystery on the other side of it, do you not? think that he's up to something through all the things that we can't understand, through all the things we can't explain. He's done this greater thing in Jesus, and it dumbfounded the world. But for us, it's the power of God unto salvation. And you know what God says? You don't have to know all the whys. You know the who. And you know me. And when your soul is tormented, and you're tired, and you're weary, and you've had it up to here, you know what he says? He says, you come to me, and you lay your head on me, and you let me love you, and you let me care for you. You don't have to have all the whys. You know me, and I'm enough. And God's chest is so big that David actually says to all of Israel, hope in him now and forever. That means he ain't going nowhere. That means that his shoulders are big enough for everybody in this room and in this world who know him to come and find peace in him. The next time you see a kid who's resting on mom or dad's chest, that's an image for you. God is inviting us, come take rest. May it be so. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We love you. We thank you for your word. And Father, I pray that it will encourage and be a blessing to your people. 
You know the ins and outs of our hearts. You know the areas where we're tempted to, pri- to be prideful. Would you wash it away, Lord, and make us children who love you and come to you. Thank you, Jesus, for making that way possible. Would you help us by your spirit to walk in that path? For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen.